Andersonville Cemetery, Georgia, a hundred or so miles south of Atlanta. Here, every Memorial Day, the prisoners of war from every conflict in which the United States has participated are jointly remembered. It is an occasion, too, for veterans to get together and reminisce, and for former prisoners to recall their repatriation and be thankful. Not every prisoner survived his captivity. Countless suffered at the hands of their captors. The American Civil War was one where prisoners did suffer unduly where it was as dangerous to be captured as to remain in combat. Yet it was brother causing suffering to brother, for both were Americans. Just as they marched into battle shoulder to shoulder, so were they buried. 56,000 died in the prisons of North and South. Now, so many decades after the event, the hurt is still there, and people still ask, why? More than 45,000 Union soldiers were confined here. And of these, more than 25% died from the harshness of war, disease, malnutrition, overcrowding, or exposure. The Andersonville National Cemetery was established in July of 1865, where more than 12,000 from the nearby prison were buried. The prisoners who died here were the victims of overcrowding and shortage of medicine resulting from the Union's blockade of the South. Ironically, it was Northern generals who were partly responsible for the ending of prisoner exchanges that led to that overcrowding. Even so, Andersonville is a blot on the face of Southern honor. Many cite it as what happens when notions of total war get out of hand. As the casualties escalated and both sides got frustrated, the South realized that after Gettysburg, a military victory was a forlorn dream and foreign intervention now unlikely. Their best hope of winning independence was to wear the North down so that antagonism to continuing the war could lead to Lincoln's defeat in the presidential election in November 1864. The Union leadership, for its part, could only counter by making the struggle so unpleasant for Southerners, both soldiers and civilians alike, that their will to resist would weaken first. The war was a bitter, destructive war because it became a war of society against society. Of course, it's always said the Civil War is the first modern war in many ways. It did not begin as such. It began as a conventional war of army against army in which the distinction between civilian target and military targets were very carefully maintained or respected. But with the abolition of slavery, with the emancipation uh, of the slaves, the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, this announced not only that slavery was going to die, but that 
the whole fabric of Southern society was henceforth going to be a military target. That to win this war, the North would have to really destroy the fundamental institution of Southern society. And this meant that there could not be any compromise, that there could not, that the war would go on to unconditional surrender of one side or another, and that it would involve vast disruption among civilians uh, as well as uh, within the military. The bitterness can be explained because it was a brother's war in very fact, and because both sides misunderstood, well, shall I say, neither side could easily forgive the other. The South thought slavery was a noble institution, the North thought it was a wicked institution, and they carried these things with us. Instead of singing John Brown's body, they sang, we'll hand Jeff Davis on the sour apple tree while we go marching on. On the other hand, there was another side to it, and that was the side of the officers, the side of the gentlemen, the side of Lee and of Lincoln. Lee never used the word enemy. In referring to the North, Lincoln didn't use the word enemy in referring to the South. And uh, there was a camaraderie of the West Pointers and others. When Pickett's baby, General Pickett's baby was born, uh, the Union side lighted up bonfires on the other side and sent over a silver service. Imagine that in World War II. Imagine that in Vietnam. It had, therefore, it was to some extent an aristocratic war. Because of the advent of the camera, we have a better idea of what the Civil War warrior looked like than we have of any of his predecessors. Photography was barely 20 years old when the first shots were fired at Sumter. Fortunately for us, many thousands of images from those days have survived. However dashing their poses, their demeanor was certainly serious. Of the third year of the war, no one was in any doubt that it was a grim, purposeful, increasingly dirty business. If you look at the second inaugural address of Lincoln, where he says, if every drop of blood drawn by the slash must be repaid by one drawn by the sword, so as it was said 2,000 years ago in the Bible, so be it. God is on our side, and that's the conviction of both sides. And if you, for example, listen to the music, uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the terrible swiftness of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. That kind of attitude means, therefore, that you are fighting not simply a war, you're fighting a holy crusade. South, as the war began to escalate and the consequences of the war began to become clearly evident, everyone in the South understood that the whole of what was the South was now on the wheel of fortune, and no one could be sure what the consequences were going to be. Southern mothers were now left to grieve, not just at a son departing, but more likely at a son having been killed. The Confederacy was dipping deep into its manpower reserves. Likewise, the North, where financial inducement failed to fill the gaps in the ranks with volunteers. Violent protests followed the resort to a draft a year after the Confederacy had done so, nowhere more so than in New York City. Only a week and a half or so earlier, out of Gettysburg had come reports of something like 53,000 casualties in three days of fighting. So that in a sense, what you will almost assume is you're a drafter, you're likely to be killed. And perhaps even more to the point was when they start actually calling out the first names. The first names were Riley and O'Shaughnessy and O'Dwyer, Mick uh, Manus and Mick Guire. And the, the immediate reaction was on the part of the Irish that they're finally giving it to us, but good, and we're going to give it back. Around this particular churchyard, out in the street, thronged mobs of people who would storm out of this area northward into vulnerable areas of the city. And what perhaps was the most lasting impact was the fact that much of the violence circled around Gramercy Park, around the wealthy mansions of Lexington Avenue, and suddenly the wealthy were being driven from their homes, oftentimes barely able to get out alive. And out of this came this sort of awesome thought that perhaps America was not immune from class conflict. 
Estimates of the numbers killed in the New York draft riots vary from 120 to 1,200, though some of the wilder rumors at the time put the figure at several thousand. They were certainly the worst street violence in American history. Units that had recently fought at Gettysburg had to be recalled to quell it. What began as a protest against the first draft under the new law quickly turned into an ugly race riot in which not only was a Negro orphanage burnt to the ground, but at least a dozen blacks were senselessly lynched. Resentment towards Negroes in many immigrant communities had been inflamed by recent strikes broken by employers bringing in blacks. The riots showed that racial prejudice was never far below the surface in the North. Lincoln was determined, though, to persist with emancipation. Essentially what emancipation is, is a very carefully measured political device on Lincoln's part to weaken the South and strengthen the North. By that I mean that he proclaimed that all of the slaves in areas behind Confederate lines were free as of the 1st of January 1863. It's a clever proclamation in the sense that Lincoln proclaimed freedom in areas that he had no control over. And he specifically exempted those areas South Carolina, Tennessee, and Louisiana that had been already been recaptured. He specifically exempted them from the proclamation, specifically exempted the border slave states of Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, and essentially said that those blacks behind Confederate lines, if they could manage to get free, that is to <laughs> escape through the lines, would be free. It prompted a rather massive exodus of uh, blacks towards the northern side. The South, in turn, had to take a variety of kinds of precautions. It, it, and the result of this sort of balancing act is that the North gets measurably stronger, the South becomes measurably weaker. And after, I would say that after January 63, one sees a decisive weakening in the Southern effort and a progressive strengthening in the Northern effort. Leaders of the black community had long pressed for the recruitment of Negro troops. They believed that once former slaves had fought for their country, they would not be denied full citizenship. But the idea was only taken seriously after Antietam. Even then, they were given mainly menial duties. Lincoln, like others, was not convinced of their military value, though Negroes had been employed in the U.S. Navy for several years. It uh, took uh, a couple of years into the war before the Lincoln administration was prepared to accept black uh, enlistments and the Massachusetts 54th, 55th regiments were the first uh, of those, uh, uh, those northern regiments to go in. Uh, were they given prominence, uh, sufficient prominence? Obviously, they were not. They received unequal pay while they were in the service. They did not get commissions commensurate to their service, nor promotions, nor recognition, official recognition commensurate to their service. And Abraham Lincoln uh, said to the black abolitionist Frederick Douglass, uh, when Douglass complained about these, uh, this disparity between the way black soldiers were treated in the Union Army and white soldiers, Lincoln said, well, that was the best he could do, that uh, blacks should be pleased that they were able to fight at all. The Civil War was a uh, very important uh, catalyst for um, uh, changing attitudes toward blacks, uh, both in the North uh, and in the South. Uh, I think the, perhaps the greatest change was in the North itself, uh, the fact that uh, during the course of the war you uh, have something like 180,000 uh, blacks who uh, serve as troops. Uh, uh, caused uh, northern whites uh, to revise upward uh, their opinion uh, of uh, blacks. Uh, it meant that they were much more willing uh, to think that uh, uh, at least those blacks who served in the war and, and by extension other blacks uh, might become uh, citizens. Uh, that if they had contributed to the saving of the Union, then the Union owed something uh, to them. The uh, use of black troops in battle, uh, sometimes in circumstances where they were essentially pushed up front as cannon fodder or used in very dangerous situations, received a, a good deal of publicity and a sense of obligation, a sense that uh, in the North, a sense that uh, blacks had helped preserve and defend the Union, I think caused a relatively more favorable shift toward blacks and prepared the way for the acceptance, uh, not immediately, but after uh, two or three years, of the idea of black suffrage in the United States. 
Wherever it appeared in the South, the Federal Army acted as a magnet in drawing out the slaves. Most blacks could recall the moment when a Northern official first told them they were free. By the end of the war, about a quarter of the Confederate slave population had freed itself by moving behind Union lines. This loss hindered the Southern war effort. Hitherto, they had dug trenches, cooked, cleaned, done everything short of firing a gun. Now the North was to benefit from their services. Though for many, their reception was not as warm, nor their treatment as tactful as it might have been. Some came to the sad conclusion that there was not much difference between freedom and slavery. Crammed into improvised camps, they were vulnerable to disease as well as to white predators. Many died before enjoying the fruits of emancipation. Some had such unhappy experiences at the hands of their northern liberators that it affected their attitudes forever. What they cried out for was land from which to derive a livelihood, but even Lincoln was not ready for this. As for those who remained behind in the South, some still wonder why they did not seize their freedom. The South was, after all, something of a police state. Laws forbade uh, the possession of any kind of arms on the part of blacks. It was even illegal in some communities for blacks to walk down the streets with a rock in their hands. Uh, therefore, uh, it would be too much to expect them to uh, to rise up. There was, though, this point, and I think it's very important, that although they were not uprisings as such, not revolts as such, uh, there was a, what has been called, there was a kind of general strike in which large numbers of blacks simply walked off the plantation. The reason there were so few slave uprisings uh, during the war itself was uh, that slaves I believe were quite ambivalent on, uh, to both sides, uh, to the Union Army and to the Confederate uh, Army. Uh, both of them could be quite brutal to them, uh, raping the land and, uh, and injuring the slaves themselves. But finally, I think uh, slaves uh, had a very conservative view to themselves and their place, their families and their kin, and were quite apprehensive about being moved about or changes that were likely to disrupt them and their kin. The Confederates did take careful, considerate, and massive precautions to prevent the slave insurrection, with the result that their mobilization for war was much less effic effective and efficient than it would have been. They had to send some 200,000 men home, for example, in July of 1861 because of insurrection anxiety. So the South succeeded in preventing slave insurrection, but at a cost. The cost being that they were not able to mobilize as fast as they wanted to and were unable, therefore, to deliver the early knockout blow that was one of the ways that the South might have won the war. It was ironic that the Southern way of life, epitomized by these great plantation houses of Virginia, which the Confederates had gone to war to protect, was now being changed inexorably by that war. Whether or not the South now won, their way of life was changed forever. The slaves had gone that made the running of these great plantations possible. To wage the war, the Confederate leadership had introduced industry to the South, had created a mercantile class, had encouraged the growing of grain. The plantation aristocracy that had taken the South into secession was by the third year of the war thoroughly discredited. Had the South been allowed to leave the Union without uh, military confrontation, then these Southerners might have been able to carry off their goals. But the one thing that almost all of them greatly uh, underestimated was the tremendous erosion that the great change of the war would have on all their cherished ways of life. Uh, they really made the terrible mistake of going into a revolution for a conservative purpose. And they found that revolution and a conservative uh, set of goals were incompatible. Jefferson Davis, in my opinion, was not the right man to lead the Confederacy. He was certainly patriotic enough. He believed in the Confederacy. He believed uh, completely uh, in, in the will to, to, to win, but he didn't make the right kinds of plans. Moreover, Davis didn't use his patronage wisely. Davis didn't cultivate people. He was too rigid, uh, too inflexible, too, too unwilling uh, to, to be a diplomat. And also, I think uh, Davis had already decided uh, the men that should should command, and once Davis committed himself to someone, 
uh, it was very hard for him to, uh, to change his mind. He supported incompetent people throughout the war, even when their incompetence is obvious to nearly everyone else. So Davis didn't have a plan to win. Davis didn't always pick the right generals. And uh, Davis offended many of the people that uh, he needed uh, for his support. So in that sense, I, I think the Confederacy was not well served. During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln acted much more decisively uh, in mobilizing um, the North. Uh, he was willing to, to violate civil liberties in a way even, even more than Jefferson Davis was in the South. He suspended the writ of habeas corpus. He was willing to imprison dissenters. But you can't compare the freedom of North and South simply on the basis of how many people were put in prison. The North was basically a more free society than the South before the war and it remained so during the war. There has never been a shrewd a political leader that I know of in the world than Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he would be perfectly straightforward and honest when that served his purpose. He would be devious when that served his purpose. He would keep his word to a man when that served his purpose. He would break his word when that served his purpose. This is not to say he was a, a, a dishonest man. He's one of the honest, most honest men I've ever read about. But he was completely flexible with regard to that, in contradistinction to Jefferson Davis, who if he gave his word to a man, there was no way in the world he could break it, no matter how much good it would do the public good or anything else. He was, he was inflexible in that sense. And Lincoln was extremely flexible, or as we call it nowadays, pragmatic. Yeah. David Donald, uh, the American historian, once said that if the North and South had exchanged presidents, the South would have won the war. I think this is perhaps an exaggeration, but there's no question that Lincoln responded to the crisis of the Civil War more effectively than Davis. What was the real Lincoln? A politician, first of all. From age 21 until the end of his life, he was always running for office or in office, except for about four years. He was a loyal member of the Whig Party, the Republican Party. He was a man who had risen through politics from poverty to considerable wealth and, and importance. Um, but nonetheless, he also was uh, a, a very decent, humane individual who hated slavery. There's no question about that. And um, really believed that slavery was a contradiction or represented a contradiction to the ideals that the nation was supposed to be standing for. Um, but I think the greatest the key element in Lincoln's leadership, statesmanship, was his, willing, his, his flexibility, his willingness to change, his willingness to grow. During the Civil War, he saw that old ideas, or traditional ways of fighting, traditional attitudes toward the military and toward slavery were not going to win the war, were not going to bring a better nation out of the war. And he changed his policy over and over again. Uh, some might say this is just uh, opportunism or pragmatism, but in the heat of a war in which old verities were really being torn apart every day, this was what was required to win. And uh, I think it's this capacity that really marked him as a great leader and a statesman. Lincoln was not only a very brilliant writer, but he was a very conscious stylist. He thought very carefully about what he wrote, which is why, unlike politicians today, you can really take Lincoln's speeches and analyze them and say, this is what he believes. Nobody believes today if a politician gives a speech that that's what they really think. There's some advantage here or there. Lincoln, in his letters, in his speeches, was so careful as a stylist and so economical in always getting down to the bare bones, the clear, pithy representation, that it did have great force, great power, great eloquence, and he was able to communicate with ordinary people in a very direct way in trying to convey what he thought the war was about. And Lincoln also, resisted the temptation, although he was a patriot and a believer in the Union, he resisted the temptation to, in a kind of sordid way, make public relations points out of the suffering or the sadness of others. Lincoln wrote private letters. He didn't try to publicize the fact that here was a woman who had lost several sons and he was writing a letter. He didn't try to gain mileage out of that politically. It was a sort of just a decent gesture on his part. And I think that's a measure of his character also. Morale among the Southern troops remained surprisingly high despite all the setbacks. It had been helped by a religious revival within many of the camps in which Robert E. Lee himself had participated. 
Although declining in numbers, the rebel army was now mainly composed of battle-hardened veterans, prepared to see the struggle through. Pride still prevailed with them. Most Confederate soldiers came from rural areas where families were clannish. Many preferred to die rather than be called coward or let down their companions. Least of all, disgrace their neighborhood. Peer pressure was strong. After Gettysburg, the Southern armies had retreated to Virginia where they had been largely left alone to lick their wounds and regroup. Indeed, the Eastern Front was relatively quiet for the rest of the year. The main center of activity was elsewhere, in the West, in Tennessee, where Lincoln had his eyes on Chattanooga, which stood on a vital east-west rail link where the Tennessee River cut through the mountains. Capturing Chattanooga would further split the Confederacy and provide a springboard for a drive on Atlanta, one of the South's key communication and manufacturing centers. Chattanooga, with its important railroads, fell in September 1863. Now the northern troops could follow the line towards Atlanta, which they lost no time in doing. The Confederates had seemingly withdrawn in confusion, but they were merely baiting a trap into which the overconfident Yankees almost fell. The ambush was discovered 12 miles south of Chattanooga at Chickamauga Creek, which in Cherokee means River of Blood. Alas, it was to live up to its name. The ensuing battle produced some of the war's most savage and chaotic fighting, much of it in thick woods. Because an order was misinterpreted, the Union line was breached. Retreating to Chattanooga, the North's commander was replaced by Ulysses S. Grant, who counterattacked where he thought the South's defenses were weakest, on so-called Lookout Mountain. The Battle of Lookout Mountain was fought basically for control of the vital federal supply routes running along the Tennessee River into the city of Chattanooga for the help of the besieged Union Army there. As you can see behind me, the bend in the Tennessee River is easily commanded by this position here on top of Lookout Mountain. And so on November the 24th of 1863, federal forces under the command of General Hooker were ordered to seize the Lookout Mountain from Confederate forces in order so that the Yankee supply line could be easily maintained without being harassed by Confederate artillery up here on the top of the mountain. On the 24th, it was a very misty day, a very cloudy day, and it was a very low cloud line hanging around the mountain. So the battle became known as the Battle Above the Clouds because of the men fighting in the mist. The federal forces assaulted the hill, drove the Confederates off of half of it, and then, like on a giant door hinge, they swung around the front of the mountain and began driving the Confederates down the back side. They probably would have succeeded in doing this, but darkness stopped them, and both sides got ready to continue the fight the next day. During the course of the night, though, the Southerners realized that they could not possibly hold back the superior federal forces that were attacking them. So under the cover of darkness, they withdrew from this position to their further eastern position on Missionary Ridge. Despite their success on Lookout Mountain, the Northerners were slow to move against Missionary Ridge. To hasten them, Grant ordered a frontal assault, meant merely as a diversion. But defying the lessons of such previous assaults at Gettysburg and elsewhere, the Union troops surged up the steep face. The Southerners could not depress their cannons sufficiently to shoot at them, so they carried on in one of the most dramatic moments of the war, sweeping the rebels from what had been thought an impregnable position. Chickamauga was avenged. The Confederates were pursued into the mountains towards Atlanta, but winter set in before they could be dislodged. Meanwhile, bridges across the Tennessee River were speedily repaired as Chattanooga was turned into a great staging post for the coming campaign against Atlanta. Freight trains by the hundred would trundle into town laden with men and equipment. The North meant business. At long last, its industrial might was beginning to tell. The South was being outproduced as well as outmanned. Huge numbers of fresh horses had to be found and forage gathered to feed them. Such were the North's resources that demands on this scale could now be taken in its stride. With the blockade beginning to bite, for the South and its suffering people, it was a different story.
uh, the blockade was definitely a factor in the defeat of the Confederacy. However, I don't believe the blockade was a major factor. I think the Confederacy could have withstood the blockade. Uh, it could have uh, developed facilities in order to, uh, to withstand defeat. That was not a major factor in the defeat. Uh, blockade runners were able to get in and out throughout the war, including uh, blockade runners in and out Charleston Harbor. Charleston, long the focus of northern fury as the birthplace of secession and hence the cradle of rebellion, as well as a major blockade running port, became the target during 1863 and 1864 for much federal naval attention. A young Virginian painter turned soldier, Conrad Wise Chapman, was commissioned by the local Confederate commander to record Charleston's dogged resistance. Charleston first had to endure bombardment from the sea, followed by assault from the shore, when the Union secured, at great human cost, a foothold on one of the islands skirting the harbor. Eventually, Fort Sumter itself was reduced to rubble, this time by Federal guns. But still, the rebels refused to yield though it meant that Charleston's days as a blockade running port were effectively over by the summer of 1864. Charleston's great attraction to the blockade runners was its nearness to Bermuda and the Bahamas, both British colonies then and centers of the lucrative blockade running business. It was this activity that made them, since until then they had been backwaters. With Charleston's closure, blockade running became centered on Mobile Bay on the Gulf and Wilmington in North Carolina. As well as weapons, the runners, many of them British built and captained, brought in luxuries that commanded premium prices in the South. But for the Union Navy, a bigger worry than the blockade runners were the ships that preyed on merchant vessels, like this, the Alabama, built in Britain, as many of them were. It was the crew of the Federal Sloop Kearsarge that finally gave the Alabama its comeuppance, though not before several hundred northern merchant vessels had been sunk. The incident produced bitter diplomatic wrangles between London and Washington, particularly as the raiders often carried a complement of British mariners. The Alabama's demise was in the English Channel off Cherbourg one Sunday morning in June 1864 trainloads of sightseers had come down from Paris for the occasion. But the South went on securing its supplies as best it could. Virtually everything useful to the South was uh, traded. In fact, some New York merchants said they could deliver locomotives if necessary through the uh, blockade by way of the British West Indies. But uh, ammunition, guns, swords, uniforms, shoes. The most important single article was food, particularly salt, uh, pork, which was a staple item in the Confederate Army and which was in very short supply in the South from early in the war because of a great hog collar epidemic that had begun before the war and continued during the war. So salt pork was of enormous importance in keeping Confederate armies in the field. In early 1863, it's quite possible that without the port coming through the lines, Lee's army would have had to been disbanded, at least in large part. About four million pounds of bacon came through the lines in southeastern Virginia and North Carolina in the early months of 63. And this was the margin of difference for Lee's army. However much Lee might have despised such trading with the enemy, he also had to put up with those state governors who wanted to keep back supplies for their own special needs. When Lee's soldiers would go barefoot, George had enough shoes in its, in its warehouses to give two pair to every soldier in the army. When Lee's soldiers froze in the winter, there were enough blankets in the warehouses of Georgia to equip the whole of Lee's army. They wouldn't let it go out of the state. There's a soldier on the retreat to Appomattox who hadn't had anything to eat in two days, ragged, famished, too weak to keep up, fell behind, fell behind, till finally 
the whole platoon of uh, northern soldiers leveled their guns at him and hollered, we've got you. And he looked back at him and said, yes, and one hell of a get you got. He was in such shabby shape. Contrary to impressions, it was the North that was having problems filling its ranks that summer of 1864. War weariness was at its height, and Lincoln despaired of being re-elected. His defeat might well be the South's last chance to win independence. Although Northerners would not admit it, there was still a lot of life left in the Confederacy. Morale, miraculously, was being maintained among its frontline troops. The rebels could still produce the unexpected, as demonstrated in the Shenandoah Valley close to Washington one day in May. The valley was supposed to have been cleared of Confederates. But even the best laid schemes are not always followed. The Union plan had been to use the valley to get behind Lee's supply lines and threaten Richmond. Instead, the Federals were confronted with a bunch of determined Southerners at the little town of New Market. Among their number were a couple of hundred teenage cadets from a local military school. The cadets were to conduct themselves bravely in a battle warmly remembered by many Southerners. Although they seemed hopelessly outnumbered, the rebels fended off the northern attacks. After all, it was their land that the Yankees were invading. Spearheaded by the cadets who fearlessly stormed the Federal guns on the hill overlooking the town, the Confederates routed the Northerners from the valley and went on to threaten Washington itself. Even at this late stage, the Union generals were still learning. Well, in the tactic realm of tactics, rifled artillery and the mini rifle lengthened the ranges, improved the accuracy, and ultimately had to change the formations and uh, uh, finally brought about trench warfare. I think probably, though, the, the biggest changes were forced in the areas of communications, uh, the telegraph. Uh, when Grant can find out every morning in 1864 what Sherman had done the day before, uh, th that was a major breakthrough in technology. The steam engine, which enabled uh, the steamboats to supply the armies up the rivers. See, every Union army was named after a river system, which I think su suggests how important that was. And the use of railroads, not so much to use tro move troops as to supply troops. Uh, and uh, in, in, in the medical services and so on. I think that's where technology really uh, uh, made an impact more than on tactics. Ulysses S. Grant's appointment in March 1864 as Commander-in-Chief of all the Union forces in both East and West was one hopeful sign for the North and one less hopeful for the South. Grant was determined to strike against Lee as soon as possible and chose the same ground as the year before, the so-called wilderness on the road from Washington to Richmond. It was to be an inauspicious debut. Standing behind these Confederate trenches at the wilderness battlefield, it's clear why the soldiers referred to this engagement in the spring of 1864 as bushwhacking on a grand scale. This was the first battle in which Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee ever met. And it was a two-day vicious engagement characterized by fighting among troops who really couldn't see one another. Grand movements were not typical of the Battle of the Wilderness. Confusion in these thick woods was more typical of the fighting here. The battle lasted two days, May 5th and 6th, and it cost some 26,000 casualties on both sides. Grant, by all estimates, had the worst of it here at the Wilderness. 
But unlike his predecessors, Ambrose Burnside and Joseph Hooker, who had also crossed the Rapidan and Rappahannock Rivers in 62 and 63, Grant took a licking from Robert E. Lee, but decided not to retreat. He made a decision to continue moving south and, as he said, fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. This was the first engagement of a long series of battles that would continue until the end of the war. Within the week, the two armies were battling it out again a few miles nearer Richmond at Spotsylvania Courthouse, a crossroads village controlling the shortest route to the Confederate capital. Here was some of the most vicious fighting of the war at a point on the rebel line which became known ever after as Bloody Angle. The burial parties had a grim task. 14,000 lost their lives. Another 16,000 were severely wounded. The North's losses could be replaced. Not so those of the South. Some of the most poignant photographs to come out of the Civil War are those of the Confederate dead that fourth summer of the war. The South, alas, was losing the flower of its manhood. Knowing this, Grant was determined to maintain the pressure without pity. But Lee met his every ploy. It was a question of whose strength or whose patience would sap first. Cold Harbor, which is where we are right now, was really uh, vital in the campaign of 1864 from Lee's particular standpoint and the Confederacy's because it blunted for a time Grant's advance which had begun in the wilderness in May. The big battle here, and as you see these trench lines, occurred on the 3rd of June in 1864, where in a period of about 30 minutes, Grant lost 7,000 men, casualties. It was such severe fire that Lee remarked that it sounded like sheets ripping in the wind. And it was one of the major defeats of that whole campaign for Grant. Now, Lee had been hoping at the wilderness and at Spotsylvania that, Lee, that Grant would do what he normally did, what the Union Army normally did, would be defeated and turn around and go back and lick its wounds and reorganize. Instead of that, Grant kept moving by his left, trying to turn Lee's right and getting between Lee and Richmond. And this is a, an attempt. Lee moved here rapidly from Spotsylvania and dug in for two days and encountered Grant's army as they moved on Richmond. The defeat here was a severe check to Grant, but he reorganized right on this field and moved again to the left. And for the first time in the whole campaign, Lee lost him. And he moved from here south of the James and began the investment of Petersburg. But this battle was so severe and the casualty lists were so heavy in the north that it severely shook northern morale for several weeks. I remember looking at a, an Albany Argus front page, the Albany New York newspaper, where the whole front page, second page, and third page were the dead from Cold Harbor, just names. And this did not go over well with the North. That's when Grant got the name Butcher Grant. And it, it bothered Lincoln. Lincoln wasn't sure he was going to survive the casualties of this campaign. The men were still fighting by old time tactics, in a sense. Uh, Robert E. Lee, uh, Sir Winston Churchill often called, the last of the great old fashioned generals. But this war also produced a new breed of general, the, the Grants and Shermans and Thomases of the North men who believed that, that war was no longer merely a chess game, but rather war was a conflict that had to be taken to an entire country, its civilian population uh, included. We call that today total war. We accept that today as war. It was a great transition for the people back then, which is simply why Sherman's march through Georgia and to the sea seems so brutal and atrocious. William Tecumseh Sherman is the Civil War general most associated with the term total war. He had succeeded Grant in the West. Sherman now sought to exert his particular brand of pressure on the Confederates. He had begun his drive against Atlanta at the same time as Grant's move against Lee. The terrain was very different, and the tactics too. Sherman much preferred to outflank his opponent than to attack him head on. The occasion when he did not, at Kennesaw Mountain in June, just a few days after Grant's debacle at Cold Harbor, 
he suffered more casualties in a few hours than in the whole of his campaign hitherto. Because his goal, Atlanta, was in sight, Sherman's patience seemed to escape him. The lesson was not lost on him, and he promptly returned to his previous tactics of maneuver and feint, which again worked. By early July, Sherman was within five miles of Atlanta. As he began his bombardment, panic seized its citizens and those who could fled, jamming the roads and crowding the trains going south. When they complained, he merely increased the shelling. War, he told them, was hell, and the sooner they surrendered, the better. The fighting was bitter, but the heart had been knocked out of the defenders. Atlanta faced the inevitable. As Sherman's men entered the ravaged city, Lincoln had the victory he needed to secure his re-election. Bring the good old bugle boys, we'll sing another song. Sing it with the spirit that will start the world along. Sing it as we used to sing it, 50,000 strong, while we were marching through Georgia. Hurrah, hurrah, we bring the jubilee. Sherman turned the rebel bastion over to his forces and ordered its civilians to leave. When its mayor protested, he simply replied, you cannot refine war. To his colleagues, he argued, we may not change the hearts of these people, but we can make them so sick of war that generations would pass before they would again resort to it. This is as near a definition of total war as one is likely to get. Germans dashing Yankee boys will never reach the coast. So the saucy rebels said, and twas a handsome boast. Had they not forgot, alas, to reckon with the host while we were marching through Georgia. Sherman now began his great wrecking march through Georgia to the sea. Before leaving Atlanta, he ripped up every rail track there was. He was cutting himself loose from his supply base and would live off the land, destroying what he did not need, determined, as he put it, to make Georgia howl. Lincoln's Navy gave him that summer in some ways a more dramatic success than Atlanta when in a daring raid they closed the last of the blockade running ports on the Gulf Coast, Alabama's Mobile Bay. It was a further tightening of the squeeze on the Confederacy. David Farragut, the hero of the taking of New Orleans two years before, was again the architect of victory. His order to his fleet when it became stuck in a minefield of damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, has become as famous as any that Nelson issued during the Battle of Trafalgar. Farragut safely, or luckily, negotiated the Confederate mines and, once inside the bay, eliminated the opposing fleet, including their new giant ironclad, the Tennessee, on which the South had placed great hopes. All in all, it had been quite a summer for the North, and Lincoln in particular. There were many Southerners who now thought they had shot their last bolt. I think the South had three chances to win the war. I think in the very first few months, they could have pulled off a military victory. In the summer of 61, I think they were that strong in comparison to what the North was at that time. I think by the end of 61, that was gone. I think their second hope for success was, uh, was foreign recognition, if that was at all a reality. And I think Antietam ended that. And their third hope was a political settlement, was Lincoln's defeat. And the fall of Atlanta ended that. 
After Atlanta and Mobile Bay, Lincoln's election that November of 1864 was a foregone conclusion. That he won it by such a convincing margin ended Southern hopes of a negotiated peace that might give them independence. Now, only a military solution was possible, and few had any doubt on that score. With Sherman laying waste everything in his path through Georgia, and Grant beginning again his meat grinder tactics outside Richmond, the South's final agony was underway. Thank you.